This is the Biological Resources Information Program for the Smartville Highway 20 Curve Correction Project. This training has four broad objectives. Hopefully by the end of this presentation you'll be familiar with all four of these points. First, we're going to cover the definition and implications of take, and then we'll move on to what your responsibilities are if you encounter a regulated species. We'll have a brief introduction to the protected species associated with this project, and then we'll go over some general mitigation measures that need to be followed in order to prevent any incidents of take. So let's talk a little bit about take. Take is a very broadly defined term. California has a different definition for it than the federal government does, but they're both very similar. So for the federal definition, take means to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, collect, or attempt to engage in any such conduct. California's definition is to hunt, pursue, catch, capture, or kill, or attempt to do any such actions. They're very, very similar, and they both mean pretty much the same thing. Anything that constitutes harassment or more is going to qualify as take. Uh, and the reason that it's important for you to know what take is is because take of listed or regulated species can carry some pretty hefty penalties. Criminal penalties can go as high as $50,000 and up to a year in jail time in some instances. And civil penalties can get almost as high as the criminal penalties financially. So it's incredibly important that you know what take is and you avoid take as much as you possibly can so you can avoid these penalties. So before I introduce you to some of these listed and regulated species that we might encounter on the project, the first thing we need to go over is what your responsibilities are if you see one of these species. First and foremost, do not touch or approach the listed or regulated species. Can't stress that enough. Second thing on the list, if the species is in the immediate project area and is at risk of being injured or killed, you need to stop work immediately. What needs to happen then is you need to notify the designated biologist or the biological monitor. If one of us isn't there, if the monitor is not present, you need to contact Alluvian Biological Consulting directly. The phone number is in each of your books. And it's here on the presentation. The principal biologist on this project is Gennaro Lockhart. Only a qualified and permitted biologist can handle and move regulated species from the project site. So now let's look at the listed and regulated species that may occur on or near the project site. Northwestern pond turtle is a medium sized turtle. The color ranges anywhere between brown to olive brown to blackish and the shell is going to be anywhere between three and a half to eight and a half inches long. The species can be identified from the lines and spots that radiate from the center of the scoots, and the scoots are the bony plates that make up the shell of this animal. Males of this species tend to have a light throat and no markings, and a relatively flat shell, and females are going to have dark markings around their throat and have a noticeably taller shell. The species typically inhabits ponds and creeks and hibernates underwater for several months during the winter. Western pond turtles reach breeding age at about 8 to 10 years of age. Uh, breeding usually takes place in April and May and what females will do is they'll climb onto land on the water margin and dig a nest. They'll lay a clutch of around 2 to 11 eggs and those eggs will gestate for about 80 to 100 days before they'll hatch. Foothill yellow-legged frog is a true frog with grainy rather than smooth skin and a narrow waist. Adults reach about 3 inches in length and the coloration can be gray, brown, olive, or red and tends to match the background habitat. Individuals may be plainly colored or could exhibit mottling to varying degrees. Females may begin breeding at one year of age, laying 300 to 2,000 eggs per clutch on the downstream side of rocks. Depending on water temperature, tadpoles hatch after 5 to 37 days and remain within the safety of the egg mass for about a week before emerging to feed. The foothill yellow-legged frog is found from western Oregon to the foothills of the southern Sierra Nevada mountains in California. 
Wainton's hawk is a medium to large sized hawk with adults getting up to 21 inches in length with 52 inch wingspans. Their plumage is variable and there are usually two color morphs. The first morph is a light phase which have dark heads, breast bands, and light bellies while the dark phase birds are going to be sooty black. Both color phases have bicolored underwings, dark gray flight feathers, lighter wing linings, a broad tail, and long, relatively narrow pointed wings. In March and April, they arrive on breeding grounds in the Solano and Central Valley counties, as well as the interior valleys of the coastal ranges. Breeding habitat includes woodlands, savanna, grasslands, and scattered trees. Swainson's hawk require large tracts of grassland and open land for which to forage. During migration and foraging, they use open lowlands, and these hawks typically occur at elevations from sea level to 1,500 feet. This section applies to all of the bird species that has been previously covered and any other species covered under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, or California Department of Fish and Wildlife Fish and Game Code 3503. A variety of bird species have been found nesting in or immediately adjacent to Caltrans right-of-ways. Nest sites are often placed in crevices, cavities, seams, or weep holes within bridges. Other nests are constructed on open vertical cement surfaces on bridges. The species that utilize man-made structures as nest sites tend to be more tolerant of urban conditions. These conditions might be increased noise, light, vibration, or simply human presence, but they can nonetheless be sufficiently disturbed during construction or maintenance activities enough to cause nest abandonment or inattentiveness, which would result in the death or loss of eggs or juveniles. Incubation and brood rearing require approximately four to five weeks for smaller birds, but can take up to 12 weeks for larger raptors. And this is why it's incredibly important that we get nest deterrence up on the project site and prevent nesting as soon and as often as possible. Roosting bats are protected by California Department of Fish and Wildlife Code 4150, and many of the habitats and structures associated with Caltrans right-of-ways have been found to be inhabited by bats. A total of 18 species of bats have been found to use bridges in California in one way or another. Roosts are places that provide security and protection where bats can rest, sleep, hibernate, mate, socialize, or feed. Roosts can take many forms and may be found in rock crevices, gaps in concrete or steel structures, trees, bridge weep holes, and many others. Bats prefer to roost in places that are in close proximity to their open foraging grounds. In many cases, you won't see bats in their roosts, but you will see traces of guano and bat droppings outside of these roost crevices, so this is something you should look out for on your job site. So now we're going to go over some of the species protection measures for this project. This won't be an exhaustive list of all of the species protection measures for this project, but just a summary of some of the important points. A full list of the species protection measures for this project can be found in your Biological Resources Information Program booklet, so please reference your booklet for the rest of those measures. If a listed or regulated species shows up on or near the project site, we'll need to set up a protective radius for it. The radius is a no-work buffer that needs to remain in place until the animal leaves the area. And for this project, all regulated species carry a radius of 100 feet unless otherwise noted in this table. There are several general protection measures that need to be followed on this project. I'll go over these quickly, but you should review these measures in your training materials. First of all, all wildlife should be allowed to leave the job site unharmed, and this includes any animals that don't carry state or federal protections. And in order to make sure that no wildlife shows up on our site, we need to make sure that all food-related waste generated during the project is contained in sealed trash containers and these trash containers need to be removed from the site daily. This will prevent food waste attracting wildlife and causing project delays later on. Um, the environmentally sensitive areas on this project should be clearly marked and fenced. 
and that means that you need to work only within the designated work area. Uh, no work in the ESA is allowed, and if the ESA fencing is knocked over or damaged for any reason, it needs to be repaired immediately. Uh, during construction operations, stockpiling of construction materials, portable equipment, vehicles, and supplies needs to be restricted to the designated construction staging areas. These areas must be located in upland habitat and may not cover riparian vegetation or leave material where it may be washed into a water body. Along that same line, hazardous materials need to be stored at least 300 feet away from water bodies. This applies to concrete washings mostly, but it also applies to any other substance that could pollute nearby streams. And finally, best management practices need to be in place anywhere on the project where sediment washing into water bodies could be a concern. Um, they should be in place throughout any area that has exposed sediment or that poses a risk of discharging pollutants into any nearby water. So we'll finish up here with some important takeaways from this presentation. First of all, back to the beginning, do not touch or approach any regulated species. Please notify your biological monitor if you see a regulated species on the project. And again, active bird nests are most likely to be found from February 15th to August 31st during the nesting season. It's incredibly important that you stay within the designated construction zone and you use the designated staging areas for this project. And please report all incidents to the biological monitor or your supervisor. Again, no hazardous waste, pollutants, or debris should be allowed to enter a water body. And this goes hand in hand with maintaining BMPs on the project site to prevent erosion and sediment loss. Lastly, and most importantly, you and your company are wholly responsible for following the measures that are stated in not only this biological resource information video, but the permits and specifications for this project. I appreciate you following along with this presentation. Uh, if you have any questions about what's been covered in this presentation, your training materials, the permits, project specifications, please direct them to your on-site alluvian biologist.